On Friday, I had a chance to catch up with Chris Lang, beat writer for the Liberty Flames, covering them for the news and advance. We talk Liberty football on this edition. We talk about the new hires of Turner Gill and his staff. Chris's thoughts on that. Who could succeed in this new system under Turner Gill? The overall look on the Big South. And we even talk about the addition of the Longwood Lancers into the Big South as well. Chris Lang on the Sports Buffet podcast. Always a pleasure to have Chris Lang back on the Sports Buffet podcast. The outstanding beat writer for the Liberty Flames works for the News in Advance. And uh, Chris, it's been quite a while since we've talked. Uh, Liberty has a new football coach in Turner Gill. You've obviously met him several times. Now, what are your impressions? Yeah, he comes off as a, as a pretty, uh, pretty stand-up guy. Uh, very, very much... Uh, He's kind of an on-message guy. He's, he's, he's not all that dissimilar to, to Danny Rocco in terms of, uh, uh, of just the way, the way he talks to the press and everything. I haven't gotten a chance to know him real well yet. We've only spoken probably once or twice in uh, one-on-one situations because he's been running all over the place trying to get moved here from Kansas, trying to recruit, trying to meet with all the players and everything. So hopefully uh, by the time spring practice comes around, I'll have a, a little bit more of a chance to, uh, to sit down with him and really kind of get to know him a little bit better. When Danny Rocco left, would you say that there were uh, hard feelings uh, on any side? No uh, fans, players, coach, anybody? Well, I think some of the players definitely had some hard feelings. I mean, there's no doubt that the, uh, some of the players felt kind of betrayed by the whole thing, and uh, uh, it, you know, at the same time, some of them then realized it's a business, and you know, they were happy that, that Rocco was able to give them a shot to play football at LU. But uh, it certainly, I mean, you know, when a guy. Uh, recruits you to, to play for four years. There's going to be a little level of hurt when he when he leaves for basically a a job that's kind of a lateral move in the in the eyes of a lot of people. It's just it's another FCS job. Yes, they won a national championship, but um, at the same time, I mean, in terms of resources and and whatnot, it's uh, the, the the jobs are pretty similar. So I think there was a lot of hurt and, and for, with some of the players, but some of the other players, I think that they they looked at it as an opportunity to start fresh with a new coach and. Uh, get a chance to get more playing time. Based on what you know about what Turner Gill wants to do and everything, uh, how many people does he have at Liberty uh, that can be meaningful to the type of system he wants to run, or is he going to run a system that maybe best fits this guy, best best fits these guys? Easy for me to say, and then kind of try to incorporate his own thing once he gets his recruits in. Well, the the, the two big things that are going to change first on defense are switching from a three four to a four three. Um, so uh, the, the interesting thing to me is going to be to see which linebackers. Uh, there's going to be some bigger linebackers that, that, that probably jump up and play defensive end now, and there's going to be some smaller linebackers that drop back and play safety. Um, they, they've got a log jam. When you recruit for a 3-4, you recruit a ton of linebackers, and there's a bunch of uh, uh, guys here now that, uh, uh, that that play the position, and, and some of them are going to move, and you know, some of them are going to stay. So we'll see how that works out. And then on the offensive side of the ball, um, the, the offense is going to be completely different. It's going to be a completely different style of quarterback. I mean, Gabe Henderson is similar in style to Mike Brown. I have no idea if Gabe Henderson is going to be the guy that gets a chance to start. He redshirted last year along with Josh Woodrum. And, um, they, Turner sounds like he wants to do more of a, a balanced, uh, not necessarily a total pro style offense, but uh, wants to run the ball, wants to get physical, wants to uh, stretch the field. Uh, but whereas the last, the last offense with Mike Brown, there was a lot of quarterback runs. There was a lot of uh, short passing, tempo passing. Um, not as much, uh, unless it was to Chris Summers, not as much of the deep ball. So um, we'll, we'll see how that changes there. But uh, certainly he's bringing some of his own guys in, too, some of the recruits. And, and uh, I certainly would, ex- would be shocked if there weren't some transfers here in the next uh, uh, few months between, between now and the start of the season that uh, guys that could fill in as well. What do you think of the rest of the coaching staff? Yeah, it sounds like it's a pretty good staff. I've, I've really not gotten much of a chance to meet any of those guys except for uh, Marshall Roberts, of course, since he's been here. But, uh, um, you know, Carl Torbush is a guy that, uh, you know, struggled a little bit as a head coach in North Carolina but has a re- uh, reputation as a fantastic linebackers coach and a defensive coordinator type. He's not going to be the D.C. here. Uh, that, that goes to, uh, uh, to Robert Wimberly, a guy that was, that was here for four years under uh, Carter and Rocco, so, you know, uh, Wimberly knows the, knows the lay of the land, so to speak, but he also knows how to work with Turner Gill because he's worked with him in Buffalo and Kansas, so that's a, that's a great move to, to bring him back. you got Dennis Wagner, a guy that, again, struggled a little bit as a head coach at Western Carolina, but has an unbelievable reputation as an offensive line coach, so, so he's going to be a guy that will fill in there. Seems like he, he's just got a lot of guys that uh, – 
um, a you know, good mix of, of experience and young guys uh, like Mike Minter that, on special teams that uh, that will really uh, you know kind of give a little uh, a bit of variety to the staff. How much of a uh, you know obviously Charlie Skolaski was kind of the last uh, lone holdout, and then he got a job with the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars, which. I don't think we can say that's a lateral move at all, going from Liberty to uh, Jacksonville. But how much does it hurt losing your recruiting coordinator at the point that they did? Yeah, you know, I asked Turner that the other day, and, and he said it really didn't hurt at all because they didn't lose any of the the kids that had already committed uh, before Charlie left. And you know, Charlie did a great job getting getting into those kids' homes. Um, you know, he did a great job in Florida. He's been he's been a stalwart down there for for Liberty for years now, trying to get kids out of out of that state. Um, but I don't really think it hurt that much. Uh, and and like you said, it's it's a good opportunity for him. It's not like he left and took the uh, wide receivers coach job at, uh, at Charleston Southern or something. A guy left and went to the NFL. So um, you know that that gave uh, Gill an opportunity to, to hire one more of uh, his old assistants uh, up at Buffalo, Juan Taylor and. Uh, and then uh, Marshall Roberts, who's been here for you know nearly a decade now, he takes over in that recruiting coordinator position. So I think that'll be a pretty seamless transition. Do you see Liberty using the transfers as much as they did when Rocco was here? Because it seemed like Liberty, I don't want to say counted on getting a couple transfers each year, but it, it certainly worked out that way. Well, I think everybody that, that's good at the FCS level has to. I mean, you're, you're going to get impact players. I mean, from Joe Flacco that went from Pitt to Delaware and ended up in the NFL with the Ravens. You, you got Stony Brook picked up a, a couple of big time transfers, and, and they they just picked up the uh, second leading rusher in the in the Big Ten from Iowa. Uh, just transferred over there for uh, after having some trouble on Kirk, Kirk Ferentz's uh, team over there at Iowa. So that you almost have to pick up those guys to keep up because uh, the, the the big level teams will do that. So I don't know if they're going to go quite so heavy on them. I think I think Danny when he first got here felt like he really needed some impact playmakers and and you know big bodies on the offensive line and used his contacts up at UVA and knew which guys were were kind of unhappy and knew that they were going to probably leave Pinnegus and people like that Rashad Jennings and uh, coming down from Pittsburgh but uh, I don't think that they're going to actively necessarily actively go out on the transfer market but certainly Liberty is a place that has become attractive to transfers of late because uh, of the facilities and an opportunity to play. Touching on Danny Rocco again real quick uh, how would you give him an overall grade here at his time at uh, LU? That's a tough one I mean he, he really did I think he, he said it the best when somebody asked him uh, when he left uh, how he felt like he wanted to be remembered here and uh, you know, he said he wanted to, to be remembered as he's a guy that kind of got the got the engine going here again and really revved this thing up. And that, that's true. I mean, it was it was a program that was completely lifeless and dead in the water at the end of the Ken Carter era. And you know, he brought the excitement back. He got the student body involved. He started winning games. He won Big South championships. The, the, the unfortunate part for him is that he wasn't able to ever win the big game that he needed to 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 get to the playoffs or. Um, or, or, or put them put Liberty on the FCS map. He had a couple opportunities against James Madison, couldn't get it done. Um, the game against Ball State was great, but then they followed it up with a stinker against Robert Morris, a team that yes, they went to the playoffs, but they had no business losing to. So that, that's that's kind of the, the the legacy. I think people were getting irritated with that. Fans were were just getting annoyed with the idea that well, he got he got Liberty to the precipice, but could not quite push him over the edge and, into being a. Uh, a top level SCS team. You know, this next question may be a tough one, but the guy that finally gets Liberty to the playoffs, whether it's Turner Gill or, you know, somebody else down the road, does that guy just have a place cemented in Liberty history? Probably, but uh, of course, the big question is will Liberty uh, be playing for playoff berths here in the next right. couple of years? I mean, that's still up in the air. So whether it's playoffs or whether it's uh, a bowl game at the F- FBS level, and I, I don't think it's out of bounds to start thinking that way. I, I mean, uh, you, you don't publicly announce that study unless you you think you have a pretty good shot of uh, of, of of going somewhere. So, um, yeah, I mean that that's the guy. I mean, I, the, the fans here want want success. They understand that the, that the uh, facilities are impeccable. The money and the resources are there, and I, I think that they're kind of sick of the excuses and and getting beaten out by. There's no shame in getting beaten out by Stony Brook, by the way, because that's the one school in this league that. And match liberty and resources and, and facilities and, and whatnot. Maybe, maybe not facilities totally, but they're, they're building up there, and it's a great research institution. It's 
it's, there's no shame in losing out to them, but I, I think it's certainly on the, the basketball and baseball side, I, I think the, the fans are getting a little antsy of seeing all this money poured into it and, and really not seeing the, the results yet. Back to this team real quick that's going to be uh, coached by Turner Gill, and I'm assuming you'll be able to answer this next question a lot better after you see some spring practice, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you now, are there any guys that you can maybe see thriving and flourishing under Gill's system that, you know, kind of weren't there with Rocco's system? And it, it can be somebody that hasn't even really gotten a chance yet, like a, a freshman or a red shirt or somebody like that, but somebody that you think Gill's system could be tailored for. Well, I, you know, Aldrichus Allen really comes to mind because cause Mike Brown ran, the, the running back Aldrichus Allen, Mike Brown, a quarterback, ran the ball so much for Liberty that, that Allen, you know, he had some games where he would get 20, 22 carries and, and be a featured back sort of guy. Uh, but there were a lot of games where then he would get, you know, seven or eight carries and then they'd try to work Sir Chauncey all the way in and try to work uh, Corey Davis in. I, I, I didn't get the feeling that from, you know, I mean, it's, Turner's got a Nebraska background. They ran the heck out of the football in Nebraska. Uh, I, I think he's going to want to establish that. Now, Drakus is a big, strong guy that I think you give him 18 to 20 carries a game and, and four or five catches out of the backfield. He's, he's going to do a lot of good things. So, so he's one of those guys for sure. And, uh, you know, I look at some of the outside linebackers. Uh, Demetrius Ward's kind of an interesting case because he's a really, really big kid for a uh, for an outside linebacker. But in a 4-3, he, he could be a, a rush end for a guy because he's really quick and athletic. So I don't know if they, you know, move him down to the defensive line playing a 4-3 or not. And that that kind of remains to be seen because he's still evaluating the roster and trying to figure out what's going on. But, uh, um, you know, those are a couple of guys that kind of stick out to me. I said we were going to only talk football, but I'm going to kind of delve into a few other topics real quick. Uh, Big South football in general. Uh, how did Coastal Carolina do, in your opinion, with their hire to replace David Bennett? I no, I did. That thing blows my mind. I'm not sure what they were doing. Um, it could turn out to be the, the move of the century, uh, the, the total think outside the box sort of thing, or it could completely blow up in their face. Um, I, I don't think we'll know until we see the. Uh, see the product on the field down there, but uh, same same thing. I think the the product had gotten stale a little bit under Bennett, and and I don't know if his players had tuned him out as much as the I think the fan base had tuned him out a little bit down there. The the, the excitement was gone, and and uh, you know they dominated the conference for the first few years. Then Liberty started spending money, and, and they started winning things. And Stony Brook came in, and I think that the administration down there just felt like they they needed some sort of bump to get going. So. But that'll be one that, that it may take a year to figure out because I, I don't really know much about Mowgli and, and what he brings. I mean, he hasn't been a college coach before, so we'll see. Right. I was going to say, overall, and, uh, you know, I, I talk about this a lot with people, whether it be college, NFL, NBA, baseball, whatever. Should you, I mean, is it really a smart idea to fire a coach when you don't really have a higher in mind, if you get what I'm saying? I mean, was could they have kept Bennett and if they didn't have a higher in mind? Because it sounds like, uh, I don't know if this guy was 1A on their uh, coaching list. Now, it sounded to me like, uh, from reading down there, and, and again, you know, these coaching searches, there's rumors all over the place. Right. That, you know, Steve Spiller Jr. sounded like a guy that, that, that they were interested in because he would have some name value and uh, down in South Carolina would help them get South Carolina kids. But uh, from what I understand, Mowgli didn't sign a kid from South Carolina in that class, which is, and I, 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 that's what I'd heard. I need to go look that up to confirm that, but... Uh, um, that would be interesting if that's the case because I, I think Coastal likes to get kids. There, there's some pretty good high school football down in Myrtle Beach, so you, you would think that there would be some kids that, that, that he'd want to get to play down there. But, um, yeah, I don't know if that was a fallback hire or if that was just uh, Yurichek and the, and the president down there thinking completely outside the box and trying to do something different to shake things up. But uh, we'll see. They took a chance, and I, I, don't, I don't know if they felt like uh, – it was that it's a huge gamble or what? But we'll see. If you had to pick an odds-on favorite for football next year, is it the same uh, same old cast of Stony Brook, Liberty, and so forth? Yeah, I think Stony Brook's the clear number one right now, and and a lot of that has to do with what they're bringing back, and then they bring in a thirteen hundred yard rusher in the Big Ten. That's that's going to help to replace Jukowski, who is a fantastic back, and Chuck Pryor is really good. Um, they, they've proven they can win on the road. They can. They can do a lot of things, so I, I just don't. I don't think Stony Brook's going anywhere. Um, I think they're the odds on favor, mostly because to Liberty, um, you know, they're bringing enough people back and they've got talent, but there, there's a lot of uncertainty with the replacing all the skilled players on offense. What's the, you know, system going to look like? What kind of other players is, is Gil going to bring in? You know, what 
yeah, there, there's just a lot of question marks to to, to, uh, to try to make that a uh, to make Liberty the favorite at this point, even though they do get Stony Brook at home. But, uh, but I tell you what, the team to watch this year is Presbyterian. They came on and played really well at the end of last year. Um, they were young. They nearly beat Liberty. They they played Stony Brook as well as, as anyone did outside of OU. So uh, and and Presbyterian gets uh, Coastal, Stony Brook, and Liberty all at home this year. So they, they could be really a dark horse. And another addition in the Big South, but it's not a football addition, are the Longwood Lancers. Uh, what do you think of the move by the conference and by Longwood? Well, by, for Longwood, it's fantastic, and, and, and they needed that. Those guys, uh, it, it's absolutely brutal and impossible to be an independent in Division One sports unless you're Notre Dame mm-hmm. or unless you're BYU. Unless you've got your own television network, uh, you know, 40,000 students and alumni base that spans the country, Longwood does not fit any of those bills. And their basketball scheduling was, um, I don't know how Mike Gillian did it for eight years. <laughs> it's just, they, they, they put weird schedules, odd road trips in, in January and February. There are times where their their basketball season would end on like February 20th because, you know, the, everybody's in conference play and conference tournaments. You can't get any games at the end of the year. Right. You're independent. Um, it's great for them. It's a great regional fit. That's what they wanted from the beginning. Um you know, for the Big South perspective, uh, Kyle Flanders, you know, I asked him about it. He said it was coincidental that uh, Liberty announces a FBS feasibility study and then all of a sudden Longwood is a, is, is a team that they're interested in, even though they haven't been tremendously interested in the past. They didn't say anything negative about Longwood. Um, don't get me wrong there, but the Big South has never been really gung-ho about them either until right now. So I, he says that. I, I tend to think that it's not a coincidence, and that's, that's my opinion, but... Uh, I, it's, it, from the Big South part, it's it's smart. I mean, they, they, this league at one point in the mid '90s went from ten to six in a heartbeat because a bunch of teams left and right. had opportunities. You can't put yourself in that position in, in this day and age because if you lose your NCAA tournament automatic berth, I mean, that kills you. That kills the entire profile of the league. So, um, it's proactive. It's a, it's a smart play. Same with picking up Gardner Webb and Campbell, and it's a good regional fit. It's not like you're all of a sudden sending your kids out to to have to play uh, East Tennessee State or Kennesaw State or Birmingham Southern or someplace like that. So, um, smart move on their part because I, I just, I truly don't think that Liberty and Coast are going to be in this in this conference for the long run. Well, Chris, as always, appreciate your times and insights. Next week, we'll get you on to talk some hoops, but until then, uh, have a great uh, weekend and a lovely time covering uh, Liberty University Athletics. All right. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Chris Lang on the Sports Buffet Podcast.